This is the Jail Ministry Podcast. The J-A-I-L, or Jesus Acts and Inmates Lives Ministry, is Christ-centered and provides programs focused on the prevention and intervention for the incarcerated. Jail Ministry also provides support to offenders, criminal justice professionals, victims, and their families. Thank you for your continued financial assistance. For more information, visit jailmen.org. Now, here's today's lesson. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Jail Bible Study. My name is Kevin McCarthy, and I'm excited to be here. And what we're going to do today is recap a little bit of the last two messages to move it into probably one of the most beautiful three words that are in the Bible. And that is Jesus saying, come to me. So if you're like me, I was running from him. And I don't know where you are right now. Are you running away from him? Do you not, not even acknowledge him? Do not want to be around Jesus, anyone that is studying or has a Bible. For that was me before God opened my eyes. So the world, if we look at the world today, the world has all kinds of earthly cares. And if we think about this, it kind of sounds like my life. We've got our job, our health, our family, our children's sports, our friends, the sports we play and also the professional sports we watch. We, I'm amazed at how many people are into fantasy football and spend hours and hours in that um, particular devotion. Music, food, sex, hobbies, retirement, what we're going to do. And all those things are great to do one at a time in its own proportion. But when a person is born anew, as we spoke about being born again, and experiences repentance, which, which is turning away from the old self and turning to the new, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what we spoke about the last couple of lessons. Um, remember, um, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and says, good teacher, good teacher, what must I do to, to have eternal life? And Jesus says, truly, truly, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. It's not something that you do, it's not some works you do, but it's coming to Him by the power of the Holy Spirit who opens up our eyes. So in looking at this, that radical new birth changes everything. If I look at the past, and the Bible says this, that we are dead people living in sin. And as dead people, we don't want to hear the gospel or the Bible. We don't want to be around Him. We run from Him. And the word of the Bible cannot come into come, cannot come into our hearts. And I usually don't do this, but I'm going to share a couple moments, a couple minutes on a personal experience, how I was right in there, and I did not want anything to do with Jesus Christ. I didn't want to go to church with girlfriends who love the word, love Jesus. I thought it was kind of foolish, a waste of time, and. My time was usually spent around bike riding, doing triathlons, skiing, running my kids here and there, playing golf, everything but going to church and worshiping and learning about Jesus Christ. And so I had to have a real radical transformation. And for those of you that have heard me in the past, I broke my neck 23 years ago. And I almost died at that time on the mountain. After I broke my neck, I couldn't breathe for about an hour or two. Just about, just about checked out. And something that happened, you know, you th would think with all that I went through the first couple of years, I almost died two more times. And my heart became harder and harder. And when you talk about these words, come to me, I had probably half a dozen friends, neighbors, come to me and say, you have to come to this Bible study. You need to get out of the house and come to this group Bible study. Well, folks, I didn't want to go. I hated God because he let me do this. He let me break my neck and put me in a wheelchair. So I was really, really angry. There's no way I wanted to go. Well, I think what happened is one of my neighbors, a good friend, Steve, kind of wore me down. And the other objection, well, it's winter time in Minnesota where I lived, 10 degrees out, kind of a hassle to get out. But I said, okay. I'll go and kind of offer me something like a beer or something like that. I don't know what it was. But I went to this Bible study of John. 
I went, I had to do my homework, and I can't tell you exactly when, but I believe it was about two and a half months later. The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Jesus Christ. So I was really dumped into the word of God in the, in the book of John, and I really did all my study questions like I was supposed to do, and about two and a half months in, there was a change. The Holy Spirit truly brought a knowledge of my sin. And one of the great pastors, Charles Spurgeon, he talks about the Holy Spirit. He talks about the Holy Spirit being like a lock, a lock on a door. And we can't get through that door to Jesus and to God, but through Jesus Christ. And the key that opens that lock is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works under authority of God. So everyone that goes and comes to Jesus has to go in through that door with that key to the locked door. And every person has a little bit different key, a little different way that they came to Christ. Could have been through a friend, it could have been through a Bible study as, as kids, it could have been the vacation Bible school. It could have been um, a parent that takes you there. You had to go, you didn't want to go, but it started to open your eyes. Well, that key, every key is different. Every one of you is different. That key goes into that lock. And that key again is the Holy Spirit. And it opens the door for us to see Jesus Christ, for us to come to him, okay? We can't come to him unless the Holy Spirit has taken our hard hearts and given us a new heart. If you recall Ezekiel chapter 36, 24, it talks about how God will send the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart, a new mind, new ears, new mouth, and a new set of values and beliefs in Jesus Christ. So that's how it happened to me, through the Word and through a person that did not want to go. But think about this. God uses people, could be someone in your jail right now, your prison right now, that dragged you along to that Bible study. It could be some letter you read, something you saw on your computer or a show that interested you because it just kept bugging you that there's something going on, okay? So God will work with all those people. He, he has plans we, we can't even figure out sometimes how we were brought to him, how we came to him. And that, it, my friends, is called God's sovereign grace. It's a free gift. If we ever had to plan this out, we surely wouldn't plan it. So, a couple of things right now. Are you running right now from God? Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you been rejecting him? Are you kind of curious right now? And my other questions, are you carrying a large burden right now? Are you carrying a burden of guilt, regrets, anxiety from what you did and what you shouldn't have done, trying to think things over, and you feel like you, you just messed up maybe the last three, four, five, maybe the last 10 years have really been doing some bad things, and you wish you'd get that off your chest and off your, off your heart. And so... I'm going to go right now to a verse that really gets into that question. And that's Matthew 11:28. Matthew 11:28. So we're going to read about three or four verses today that are based around come to me, which Jesus gives in different angles, different situations, different portions of the Bible. So turn your verses to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. I think what happens when you look at this verse the first couple times, you go, oh, yeah, okay, I, I see it. But if you really study it and you look at what he's saying and you do a little digging, um, I go on the internet sometimes and I'll, I'll enter those words, come to me. Because I want to learn more about what was happening at the time. So Jesus says in verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. Now, in my Bible, you will find rest for your souls is bold-faced capitals. He finishes this section by saying, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So before I dig into that for a few minutes, remember, or if you don't know, a yoke at that time was a wooden a piece that was notched out for the ox or the horse or whatever animal was dragging the, the, the plow or the wagon and it fit on top of their shoulders and they had to drag that that wagon that may have weighed three or four or five hundred pounds so he's saying that are we carrying a yoke a yoke of bad memories a, a, a yoke of regrets I know I regretted a lot of things that I had done in the past and it starts going further and further back and at some point you have to look at it and say, well, I know we're responsible for those actions, but there are some things that you cannot change. You have to move on from those things. Um, accept those things as maybe things that you have learned from, and you surely won't do those again. But if you've truly repented and made amends to people that you've harmed, and they've accepted your apologies, then you have to move on, especially when you are a new creation in Christ, born again. Those things you did are there to think about and to turn and change from, but we don't allow ourselves to fa fall into that pity, the self-pity. And that can be really destructive, can cause a lot of depression. So it's a balance to think about the things we did that were, were bad, evil, wrong, and the amount of time we're gonna spend dwelling in them. So he says, come to me. Now, at that time, Jesus says, I will take your heavy burden, okay? For I'm strong, I'm infinite. So, so don't weigh yourself down with those things. And he says here, he says, he says his demand is, is not heavy, all right? He came to offer himself for our eternal enjoyment. So think about that. And it didn't really make sense for me at first, but when I thought about it now, maybe five, 10 years later down the road, I thought about it, wow. He's right. He will take our sorrows. He will take the longings that we have, the things that happen wrong. I know I've lost some members of my family. And as the Bible says, if you're in Christ, the, our family might be separated from people who are in Christ and who are not in Christ. And those, those relationships that are broken up, they're difficult, they're painful sometimes. But in retrospect, you learn to pray for those members of your family or friends who, who are not saved, who are not Christian. Because we're, we're either in the world or we're in Christ. And remember, the world is very powerful. It draws, it pulls on you. We have to be careful not to spend uh, all of our time in the world, either on a computer or whatever entertainment it might be. It may even be fishing or golf. A lot of fishermen, wonderful sport, but a lot of fishermen become obsessed with weekend fishing. Got to go every weekend. Got to catch that trophy bass, and they always have to be out there at the at the at the loss of their of their faith. So Jesus looks out. He says, He says, I've spoken to you that your joy, my joy, may be in you, and that your joy might be full. So. Our joy is in Him, in Christ alone. And there's a simple verse that I like because it, it's short and sweet, but the, the verse is, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'll have to look that up. I know where it is right now, but I can't think of it right now. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And that kind of keeps you focused. He says, come to me is the essence of those demands. Come to me. So it's, it's a command. And one of the things we have to learn is we have to become obedient to God's word and obedient to Christ. If he's God, he's perfect. There is no sin. So we can't possibly go the wrong way if we follow his commands. Now, that heavy burden also relates to, in Christ's time, the religious uh, leaders at the time, the Pharisees, they had over 800 laws 
that you had to do to become a good person and a good Jew. So not only the Ten Commandments, but over 800 dietary laws and religious laws and family laws, it was endless. And so people at that time felt like they were never quite good enough. And even if they did most of these commands, a lot of times they'd have pride about it. So Jesus is saying that, no, you don't have to do all those things. It's when, I, when you come to me, remember, God gave us the Ten Commandments. We're to obey the Ten Commandments. We can't always fulfill or honor those, but we rest in Christ because we know the, the law, the, the Ten Commandments, is the teacher that leads us to Christ. So it's a beautiful, beautiful promise in Scripture because you learn that it's not about what you do, it's about what He did. So you can rest in Him at the end of the day. Okay. If we look at all the other religions of the world, um, they were all about lifting heavy loads. And I know Islam is the same way. And interestingly, in Islam, Muslims do not have a word for salvation. They don't believe in eternal salvation. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So that's a good portion of the people out there that don't believe that we are saved from our sin. So, so many of these people carry those heavy burdens, even in our country today, okay? He says, he came to carry the load and calls us to rest, to rest. And that's sometimes hard when you have all these things going through your head. If you're looking at trial dates, your attorney, problems with your cellmate, all those things going on, it's difficult sometimes to just give that up and trust in Him. One of my favorite verses to memorize is Proverbs 3, 5. Kind of ties in with come to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all of your ways. And He'll make your path straight. So trust in Him, not the world. Not the news on your cell phone. Not what's going on in the paper. Not what's going on with politics. Trust in Him alone. Okay? Don't take all those burdens on. The burdens of the government. The what's going on in the country. And this and that. At the end of the day, you can't change those things. So trust in the Lord. He says, Come to me who labor and are heavily laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll repeat that again. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. And that's the beautiful thing about Christianity. It's not a faith of wealthy types, important types, very powerful people. No, it really came from Israel and came from Jesus speaking to the least of these. And I think sometimes we're blessed that we don't have too much money. We don't have too much power and influence. We don't have too much status in the world. We're not caught up in all those things. And that's one thing that may have to be broken for some of you. It's not about the car. It's not about the house. It's not about your wife and not about how well you do. It's about Jesus Christ. He does expect the best of you, but it's not about accomplishments. And I think what happens in people is the more they get caught up in money, the more the money starts to build and it becomes their idol. And when it's their idol, they start to lean on their own power, their own prestige, their own possessions, and pride comes in. So it's very difficult sometimes for people who are wealthy. They, they've worked hard for 30 years or now 45, 50, and they, and they feel like, oh, I've, I need to achieve more. I don't really think I need to go to church because I'm a good person. So, something to think about. So, Jesus also says in Matthew 7, 14, He says, The gate is narrow, and the way is hard. That leads to eternal life. So that ties in with this message of come to me. In that, Jesus is the gate. He's the only way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father 
but through me. So that gate is narrow. And some people will say, oh, you're too rigid. You're too judgmental. You're not, you're not, ex um, you don't allow other religions. You, you're not sensitive to those things. Well, no, we, we realize that he is the only way. Broad is a way that leads to destruction. And many will find it. Many will find the broad way. The broad way is anything goes. Okay, as long as you consider yourself a good person at the end of the day, do some good things, the bad will outweigh the good. So, Jesus speaks about that. He says, he says, I am the narrow, I am the narrow way. Okay, it's hard. It's not really hard, but it's the only way. A couple other things now. Jesus is not the burden. When we come to him, he's the burden lifter. Think about that. The burden lifter. And I'll tell you this much. As a quadriplegic, I have endless medical issues that could happen. And I could spend every morning and almost every waking minute and hour worrying about what could happen next. And I could have, I'm in the hospital sometimes once a year for five days. But I can't choose to live that life about worry and anxiety about what could happen, what could happen. I trust in Him, Him alone. I'm not being blind. I live a healthy life. And it's telling you, you still have to do the work. You still have to do your part to read the Bible, to treat other people with respect, God the respect, honor the Lord. But it's telling you that you should not be worrying about this life or, or next day or the days down the road. Um, he also says, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me. So when he's talking about that water, he's talking about the living water. If any of you have studied the uh, woman at the well, we're talking about the water that sustains forever. It's eternal life. So that water that we take, when we hear this verse, we go, come to me and drink from me. We're thinking, what? Well, it's almost too simple. Well, Jesus is keeping this rather simple because he's saying we all need water. We can't go a day without water. But I am the living water. The water that I provide for you, when you drink of me, it leads to eternal life. And that's pretty, pretty awesome. Eternal life, life forever. He also says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, okay, shall not go hungry. What's he talking about here? Well, in the context of the Bible, Jesus had just gone, gone from feeding the 5,000. Um, in actuality, it was probably more like 5,000 men, 5,000 women, and probably 10,000 children. So he fed about 20,000 people with, if you recall, those five pieces of bread. So the people who witnessed that miracle and were fed by him, they followed him. And it's interesting because Jesus would say, he would say, I didn't come to bring the bread. I am the bread of life. I will sustain you. I'm the food that you need to live forever. So they, some, some left him. They were still looking for that food. But Jesus says, no. If you listen to me, believe in me, pray with me, I am the bread of life. You'll never go hungry. You'll never look for anything else. And that's the beautiful thing about when you're born again. It's really simple. It's about Jesus Christ. Okay? He says also, he says, He is the bread of heaven and the source of everlasting life. Now, people at that time thought, what's he talking about? Okay, but when they saw the miracles and when Jesus changed people's hearts, they noticed those changes and more people would come to him. Okay, the next verse I'm going to have you go to is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 through 4. It says, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. It's a beautiful verse. 2 Corinthians 4. 
verses 3 and 4. Okay. Bear with me. I have one hand that works. I have a new Bible that's really slippery. And Paul is going to say, 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, he's going to say this about the people that don't see the Bible, they don't see Jesus. He says in verse 3, it's going, to, it's going to flip. And even if our gospel, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he died and he rose three days later. That's the gospel, that Jesus is our Savior. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, well, that means veiled means covering. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So those who, they can watch someone preaching downtown with the Bible and say, that guy's crazy. Their, their eyes are veiled. Okay, They're, they don't see it. And until God does something supernatural, they won't see it. So he goes from perishing to verse 4. He says, in, who, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not, might, so that they might not see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. I'll take that slower here. Those people of this are following the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? It's Satan, isn't it? So they're following Satan. They're living in Satan. Their mind has been blinded. They're unbelievers. So that they may not, they may not see the light of the gospel. They don't see the light. Or the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. Verse 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's almost too much. I'm going to read it again. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness and that's his son Jesus in the one Jesus who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Wow. Okay, but remember, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin and repeats is a slave to sin. Are you a slave to sin? And guys, I'll talk about this kind of frankly right now. When you get out, if you have your cell phones, are you into cell phone pornography? No. Numbers right now are around 90% of males. So are you a slave to your sin? If you are, you better turn to Jesus Christ and get some help. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. See where that word come? They don't come to the light. They're coming to the darkness. They're in the darkness already, okay? They're not turning to light. And that's pretty scary. When you see, we watch crime shows on TV, usually a couple nights a week. We see these things happening with um, trafficking and sexual predators. And it, it's absolutely so evil. And you see these people who are dressed quite well, driving a nice car, good job. They're married. They have a couple kids. And then they have this alter world. And I'll talk about it because sex trafficking and, and pornography, that's the number one sin in our country right now. It's so wicked. But you think about it, they're in the darkness. They're not in the light. Okay? We've got a minute to wrap some things up here. It says, well, how has anyone ever come since we're all slaves to sin? We're all slaves. He says, no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. So God sends the Holy Spirit for you to open your eyes to Jesus Christ so that you may come. God grants the gift of new birth and repentance, which opens the eyes of the spiritually blind to the truth and beauty of Jesus. 
when this happens, our affections, everything changes. So think about this. When you are born again, and when you come to Christ, everything can happen at once. The repentance, you can now just sin, you turn away from your sin, and you beg for Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. So, guys and gals, come to Jesus. Come to life. Come to light. In Jesus' name, amen.